I'm going to talk about getting started on Earth, Moon, Earth. And a lot of people think that this is really hard or difficult, and I like to change your, your mind about that. I'm kind of here like a, uh, someone who's trying to recruit you in to get involved with uh, EME. Now, my interest in EME has been primarily on the higher bands. I have operated on, on 144 and lower bands, but my main interest has been on 432 and up. And I'm going to concentrate this evening on 23 centimeters and up. But I want to say that a lot of what I'm saying here applies to 144. Some people find it much easier to get on 144 than, uh, than 1296, for example, because it's higher and the equipment is around, but not as readily available as for 144. The nice thing, as I'll show you, at the higher frequencies, you can get by with a lot smaller antenna. And having big antennas sometimes is a problem for people. So if we go on uh, down here and go to the next slide. Uh, and this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, talk about why 1296 and up EME, uh, and uh, show you that it's relatively easy. Uh, uh, talk about how it's done, what it's needed, and conclusions. And I will say, I like to keep things, actually I prefer the light on, but if you can't see it, uh, it's better to have a little light uh, on. I prefer to have an interactive session. So if anyone has any questions or things I say that uh, you like uh, explain further, don't be afraid to, to interrupt and, uh, and ask questions. So, we go. next slide. Okay, I thought I'd start off in my introduction and talk about a little bit about EME uh, was first applied uh, in radar. There were uh, a number of radar stations uh, during the Second World War, and some of the early history uh, has examples of people actually hearing what they thought, they weren't sure, were reflections off the moon using radar. Uh, there was a group, and I, I put this up here because I think this is kind of interesting. Uh, it's almost like a science uh, type of thing. When you, you have EME, you're going to transmit a signal, and you're going to send that signal up to the moon, and then you're going to listen for the echoes on your receiver as it comes back. And one of the early attempts to do this was to take a transmitter, and they would, the transmitter would tra send the signal up, the receiver, it would listen, and when it was doing this, you can picture the system. It's like recording it. The signal would go around, it'd be picked up and it rectified and would charge a capacitor. So you can picture you got a, a switch with a bank of capacitors turning around, right? And what they did is they basically sent out the signal and they looked at which capacitor had the most voltage. And they did this for, a, you know, literally thousands of times. And of course, the more they did it, the more they could show that two and a half seconds later, that, and that's roughly the time it takes to get a reflection back from the, earth, from the Earth to the Moon, they would pick up a large, a large voltage on the capacitor. Now, actually, they didn't use a capacitor, the group that did this. They used a thing called hydrogen jars. I remember reading this, and I was trying to say as a high schooler, what the heck are they doing with hydrogen jars? Anyone know what, what a hydrogen jar is? I see a younger member here. You ever take chemistry? And, and, well, you did the electrolysis of water, right? Remember that? You put some voltage on water, and you broke water up into hydrogen and oxygen. Well, that's what they actually did. They had the signals coming out going to a water, a couple electrodes in water, and they analyzed the gas that was produced. And so they had a, they had, they had a collection of hydrogen in the, these different jars. They were, they were picking up the gas and the gas that corresponded to when the switch was two and a half seconds later had the most hydrogen in it. In fact, a great deal more hydrogen than the other, uh, other uh, positions. Now, the, the question is, why do you think they use this, really what sounds like we call it Rube Goldberg uh, type of arrangement? You know, you've seen all the cartoons with the, 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 the belts and the, and the uh, things that roll down, the dominoes, you know, this seems like a kind of, I guess, the ham term, the kludgy way of receiving signals off the moon by performing hydrolysis of, of water, right? Why do you think they did that? Anyone have any ideas? 
This has to do with capacitors. And capacitors only hold their charge, but especially back in the 40s, capacitors weren't as good. Capacitors were leaky. And so if you're doing this over a period of, of weeks, you had a problem of the capacitors just discharging on their own because they weren't perfect. But when you did the hydrolysis of the water, you had something that didn't, wouldn't discharge. The, the oxygen would stay there no matter what, no, so no, no matter how long you, you waited till you did the analysis. So this enabled them to, to take many, many uh, recordings and not worrying about having a problem with the discharge of the capacitors. And that's why they did. This was actually done in Hungary uh, by a, gr a, a group of hun hun really Hungarian hams that did this. The first really considered official uh, reception of signals, echoes off the moon was done here in New Jersey. It's amazing how many things were done in New Jersey. And Patterson, particularly, was known for many, many technical uh, firsts in the past. This one was down by Fort Monmouth in what was called then the Diana radar dishes. And they actually used a big array, collinear array, uh, at 115 megahertz. That was right down. Then you had the two and a half meter band. The two meter band didn't even exist back around 46. Uh, it, it came slightly later. So it was done at 115 megahertz. And the person who led the operation was a ham, W4ERI. In fact, if you look into the history of technology and a lot of the first that were done, a lot of these things were done by radio, radio amateurs. And uh, they put this big antenna up and they could see these nice echoes, signals coming back off the, off the moon. Now that was in 1946. If we go on, so after that was publicized and people knew about it as hams, we wanted to make use of it. You know, you, you hear of something and you find amateurs are always among the first to try and experiment it with this. And the first echoes reported being heard by hams was in 1953. Uh, there were, there were several hams. One of them was here in New Jersey who were experimenting with big antennas on two meters. This work was done on, on, on two meters. But they were not unable to ever have a two-way contact. They heard, they heard echoes, but they never made a contact. It wasn't until 1960 that the first two-way amateur radio contact was made. And that was made on 1296 by a fellow by the name of Sam Harris. I remember him as a teenager. He used to write a column for CQ. And then he took up the VHF column for QST. And I used to think, boy, that was my idol. I mean, I would run to get the, the, the issue every month and see what was going on, on on VHF back then. It was one of the most exciting things to me at that time. So uh, Sam started off this, of course, this revolution or interest in, in EME. It was a couple of years after that that he, he made uh, QSOs on 144 and then two meters follows. It was a very interesting time. It wasn't until 1976 that work all continents was done by, at VHF by bouncing signals off the moon. And I had the good fortune, the luck, to be in the right place at the right time. And a lot of things have to do with, with luck. Uh, and, uh, and, w and was at one end, or I was the end, I guess, of, uh, of the first whack. It took a while uh, for uh, 10 gigahertz to get on. This is three centimeters referred to it today. Uh, and that was in 1989. And in 202, we had 47 gigahertz. EMA communications on. So we keep climbing the ladder, going to higher, higher frequency. And people are right now working up very near to 80 gigahertz at getting echoes at 80 gigahertz. And they actually have heard echoes, but there hasn't been a two-way contact up at the 80 uh, gigahertz band. Actually, I think it's 87 gigahertz. So that gives you an idea of what's happening in, in EME. If we go on to the next slide, here uh, I said, why, why work moon bounds? You know, why am I excited about it? Why should you be excited about it? Well, uh, when we talk about amateur radio, it's very exciting. When you go into your shack and you press your key and you go da, 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 and you hear da, da, da come back from the moon, I, I, even today after doing this, you know, literally thousands of times, it's still exciting when I hear those echoes. And even more exciting is when you 
put your you know, microphone up to your mouth and you say, hello, moon, and you hear the hello, moon, come back from the moon. There's a, quite a bit of sideband that's done on the moon today. Uh, and that's, it's really an exciting thing. And the truth is that most of the fun in amateur radio is making rare, unusual, difficult contacts. Not everybody, but I'd say the majority, certainly the DXers are considered by far the most popular group here. So EME allows you to work DX, and if you collect grids, little grid squares, more grid squares, then you can do by a tropo. That was, you know, in the early days, that's what was attraction to me. I was always trying to work further. How much energy do you lose between transmit and receive? Between transmit and receive, I think I have that information here later on, but it, it roughly is, uh, and it depends on the frequency and what you're using, but the, the, the loss is around 200 and let's say 260 dB, because it does vary it uh, with how far you are from the moon. It's, it's really a weak signal. You know, I, some, I've heard analogies where someone says it's equivalent to a fly flapping its wings at, you know, so far, but uh, that doesn't have any meanings. I have no idea how much energy a fly makes flapping its wings. Anyhow, so EME allows you to make these di distance contacts. And if you're a, a kid, when I first got into this, I was in high school, uh, the idea you know, of working to Philadelphia from up here in North Jersey was exciting back then. So if you could work to the other side of the world, that is real excitement. Uh, and the reason I'm focusing here on 1296, because of the higher bands, it's, it's actually easier than at the lower, lower bands. Uh, so one of the issues is also is the involvement in technology. You probably have heard the t term STEM for science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, we have a real problem. And we have it here in our ranks. I see a lot of people like myself, which is, are getting gray, right? Uh, we're getting older and older as a hobby. And, and how do we get younger people into the hobby? How do we got to do things that are exciting or adventurous? So, uh, and I consider EME is one of the things that really turns younger people on. Because it's hard to do. It's not easy to do. It's hard to do. Uh, and if you compare us, you know, it's really scary. Here in the US, uh, we have less people on EME on 1296 than in OK, in Czechos Czechoslovakia, actually, the Czech Republic. I don't know why they couldn't stay together, but the Czech Republic, we have less hams who are on EME here in the whole United States than Czech. You can go on, you can check off the, the numbers of stations on, and, and that's a problem here. Uh, generally, there's a lot more VHF scientific-oriented activities coming out of Europe than here in the US, and that shouldn't be. We should be competitive. I'm not saying we have to always be the greatest, but we certainly should be in there and playing the game, right? And it, it, it's frustrating. And as I say, it's easy. I show you these are antennas that people I've worked and who are active off the moon. Here's a single Yagi. Here's a small TV dish. You know the fellow who does this, uh, a younger fellow, who's made contacts with that TV antenna on 1296 EME. So you don't have to have a, a huge antenna to do this. And if we can go on, I so show some other examples here. Uh, this was the first station I worked using a digital technique, and I'll talk about that, because you heard me refer to CW, Morse code. We, we, I referred to single sideband voice. But one of the problems we have today is that not all hams need to pass the code test to get their license. And uh, CW turns out to be easier to make contacts with when they're very, very weak than with single sideband voice. Uh, but it turns out there's even a better way if you're trying to do things with the least amount of power and the least equipment, and that is you have digital techniques. I heard that you had uh, Joe Taylor here uh, 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 some months ago or a few months ago. It's always rough to follow up Joe. He's just a, such a, a, a terrific human being and a, a wonderful speaker. But Joe probably has changed amateur radio, at least in my lifetime and your lifetime here, than anyone else. And, and part of it is getting people interested in using some of the digital modes and digital technology. And this has really affected amateur radio. So my first digital contact, I, someone said, you gotta try this. 
And so I, I tried it. I, I worked this guy here. His antenna are just two long Yagis on, on 1296 he had. And he had only a, a transmitter. You know, people think, well, you've got to run kilowatts, right? He was running 40 watts. Uh, and this was the early days when digital techniques have been perfected quite a bit since then. Uh, and he was running linear polarization. That's something that you probably don't know too much about. But you know that antennas are horizontal and, and vertical. Uh, a on 1296, a lot of the hams, the majority, operate what's called circular polarization. And when you work a station that is linear, you lose half your power. You lose 3 dB. So besides everything else, having this really small station and low power, uh, he was running linear to myself, who was running circular, most of the other stations he, he worked. So what I'm, I'm getting at here is you don't have to be perfect. You can have a lot of things that are less than perfect, and you can still make contacts off the moon, particularly on a band like 1296. OK, if we can go on. Uh, I just going to show you different examples of, of things that people have done and with small antennas here. This is a, uh, a guy who was at the South Pole. And he, he brought his 1296 equipment with him to the South Pole. He was there for a couple of years. And literally, this is what he did. He would push his antenna down into the, into the ice. And he ran a single Yagi. And, and he had this uh, outside uh, hut, so to speak, they had down there to get operate in. So he was running a, a single. Uh, single Yagi down at the South Pole, and he, he worked a bunch of people on, on 1296 a, a few years ago. He was there for about a year. We can go on and just, this is, uh, you know, people think, well, I'm going to work moon bounce. I got to have this big contest station. I got to have the fields, right? I got to have a lot of space. Well, here's a uh, guy from Belarusia who's quite active, and all he operates from is his balcony of his, of his home. And he's got a little dish here. This is his balcony, and this is where he operates on. And he's not someone who just comes on occasionally. He's on there all, all the time. Now, in a situation like this, you want your balcony, it's got to be facing south, because the moon really doesn't come up in the north. It rises in the east, and it goes up to the south, and sets in the west. But if you're fortunate enough to have a balcony or a window that you can set up with, you can literally make moon bounce contacts, particularly on a band like 1296, where the antenna can be small, operating from your balcony. And I have a few pictures showing people who are operating from their uh, balcony with, with relatively small antennas. Uh, another interesting guy, Bodo, uh, this fellow, when he was still in, in, uh, in high school, I think he started, he started going around operating portable on EME. And he would go around with a, a single Yagi from a, his car, and he was running 80 watts. So he had the single Yagi and 80 watts in his car, uh, where it ran off the batteries. And he would go all around to different countries that were uh, not that active off the moon. This is a picture of, of him in uh, Monaco. Monaco, if you don't know, is a small country uh, near Italy uh, in the south of France, in that area there. And he literally he drove into Monaco, went at night, so there wasn't going to get too many people, picked the night when the moon was up. And he literally put his pole next to, I think these are signs or something, he strapped his pole down for his antennas, pulled up here, and, and operated from Monaco and gave a bunch of people QSOs with Monaco for the first time on 1296 EME. Uh, then uh, he went to many countries. This is a, a shot of him, him in uh, uh, San Marino, another one of these pocket company, countries, I'll call. Very small. You drive in, you set up, and make contacts, give out another DXCC. We call these the expeditions. But this is, this is the, the easy de expedition. You don't have a lot of, of you know, a, a boatload of equipment. You just drive your car and an antenna. And if you're fortunate enough to be in a place where you can get to this, you can give out a lot of contacts. Show myself, I've gone on a number of EME de expeditions. And I had a, a meeting, actually, I was going to in Bermuda. So this is myself in Bermuda. I brought this dish, which is a small dish, a little bigger than the ones you saw. 
but it carries all down. So you can carry it as literally uh, carry-on luggage on a plane. So we went to Bermuda. That's the whole station uh, right there as we got on the, on the plane in Bermuda. And I originally planned to operate from the balcony in the hotel, but somehow my, my room reservations got screwed up, of course, and I was situated in a hotel with a balcony that was facing north, not south. So I had to go out and scout out a different place. And actually I found, a, this is out in the back of the hotel where I had a, a shot to the, the south. I could point at the moon near where they rented the, ever, anyone here been to Bermuda? And got a couple people here, you know, you ride the, the little motor scooters there. So this was next to the motor scooter shop. And literally I set my, my dish up using a, uh, a little uh, umbrella stand that was sitting there and got power, convinced the people in the motor shop to let me have power. Originally, I was going to just operate from my, my room. Question? No. So uh, that was my, uh, my setup there, and I had a lot of fun operating portable. Is that a homebrew dish? Yeah, it's a homebrew dish. It's just a bunch of pieces of, of wood, some screening that's rolled up. Everything fits in this box over here. And uh, it has a simple feed. because I wanted to keep it. Your feed can be bigger than what you, you carry in your dish. These are some other examples. Uh, what do you need? Okay, you can see I, I've been emphasizing the easy end of this. So what is the minimum you need? So I would say you need a five meter long single Yagi, can be smaller, but a, a, a Yagi antenna. I think most people know what a Yagi antenna, that's a Yagi antenna there. Uh, you do have a problem because you lose 3 dB. I mentioned this, the cross pole, that people run circular. Uh, so you, you, but you can live with that. You can make, definitely make contacts. And there, there are ways to go around this. Some people have used cross Yagis where they have one Yagi vertical, and one Yagi horizontal, but on the same boom, and they switch. And they get around this problem so they can phase it to be circular or switch polarizations. Uh, you can also use a small dish, as I showed you in my own example. Uh, six foot is really more than adequate to work a lot of stations with circular pole. And there's some examples of, of uh, small sh dishes that have, people have used. Uh, this actually is the same dish you saw in Bermuda, but I lent it to actually Bodo, the fellow I mentioned before, who usually goes to Yagi. He took a vacation in the Bahamas, and he was going through the US, and I lent him my portable dish, and he operated down the ba Bahamas with it. This is the way you get around the circular pole by using vertical and horizontal linear poles and combining them. But anyhow, if we continue on. Um, for the circular polarized the antennas, left or right? You transmit, it gets complicated. And I usually put together a diagram. Because if you're using a dish, when a circular polarized signal reflects off the surface of the dish, it gets reversed. This is very interesting. So when you normally transmit, you transmit one pole. And I think it's left-hand pole, but I won't swear to it. I got to look it up myself. I always look at the diagram, okay, and I connect up this way, okay, I got the right pole. This is going to get reversed at the reflector. When you get to the moon, the polarization is re reversed again. So if you transmit on left-hand pole, then you receive on right-hand pole. Very, very interesting. This is one of the problems. You've seen people use helical antennas, and they show you helical antennas, and I've seen some people build big arrays of helicals, supposedly for EME, and I'm afraid those people who did that were really misguided because they can't hear their own echoes and they have to make sure they work someone with the opposite circular pole than the helixes that they're using. A helical antenna is something that looks like a, uh, a slinky. It looks like a big corkscrew antenna. And it's not particularly high gain besides that, but it really is, is bad for, for EME because of this problem with needing to receive on one pole and transmit another pole. Fortunately, the dish type uh, feeds that we use, they are set up so they receive when, on one polarization, circular pole, and they transmit in the other. It's built right into the, the feed antenna, so it's taking care of, of you autom automatically. And the same thing if you build it up with vertical and horizontal, you can use a device called a hybrid combiner. And the way it combines, when you transmit, it comes out one pole, circular pole, and when you receive, it comes out the opposite circular pole. So if you're right, it's left. And these, I just 
just show these in as different examples of antennas that people have experimented with. Uh, this was a fellow, these are, if you look carefully, this is a helix, 1.75 meter long helix. This is a fellow from Spain who's been active, but his, he realized this, so he has the two helixes. He has one that's right and one that's left, and then he uses, uses one for receive and one for transmit. So he has to have two helixes rather than one. I, from my own point of view, I'd rather have two Yagis and get the gain of the extra Yagi, but it works. And let's face it, really what counts is what works. So this is something I suggest to the people, uh, another small portable dish that makes use of an offset structure. You don't have to have a full parabolic reflector to get an antenna that works very well. You can just take a portion of a parabolic reflector. And as long as you put your energy, concentrate your energy on the portion of the dish that you're using to radiate, uh, you can, that will work as effectively, in fact, in some cases, more effectively, depending on the way you illuminate it. So this is uh, an idea. It turns out to be more flat than a normal uh, type dish, and you can set it very close to the ground when you're not using it. So this is, this is based on the on offset concept. I've written a few things about offset uh, dishes, simple handmade, homemade ones, I should say. And this, you can't get much simpler than this. So, and we had some questions before, you know, what is the loss uh, on, 12, and this is 1296, now I said about 260 dB. Uh, you see here 1296, it says 270 dB. Well, remember, 1296 is about three times the frequency of 432. If you work it out, that's about a 10 dB difference in loss. So it appears as you go higher in frequency that you have a greater loss uh, as you radiate. And so you might say, well, I'm better off operating as low a frequency as possible because I'm going to have more loss. But the truth is, You've got to understand the mathematics. A lot, of, uh, a lot of times this isn't adequately explained. The path loss is calculated on the basis of two theoretical antennas that are called isotropic antennas. The isotropic antennas is a theoretical concept of an antenna, an antenna that radiates equally in all directions, okay? And so if you measure the path loss between two isotropic antennas, zero gain, because the energy is going in, in all directions, the path loss appears to go up in frequency. The reason, and it's, it's, it's kind of an abstract concept, but an isotropic antenna has more area as you go down in frequency. You picture a, a dipole. A dipole on 1296 is about this long, right? Okay. You know, a dipole on 160 meters goes, you know, way out of this room, right? Which one has more area associated with it? the 160 meter dipole. So it's going to accept, it's going to intercept more energy out of the, out of the, out of space, out of the air. So this is why the path loss equation, if you just don't, uh, you don't appreciate it, appears as you go higher in frequency that you, you have less path losses because a, a basic antenna has more area, okay? But if you take a fixed size antenna, for instance, a dish, if you have a dish, let's say a, uh, a, a three meter dish, which is very typical. A lot of TVRO dishes people use, they're around literally for free, you can haul them away. Uh, if you look at the loss between two three meter dishes, you'll get more signal the higher in frequency you get. In other words, a, a, an antenna that has a fixed area associated with it actually has less loss as you go higher in frequency. The signal will be stronger. And this is why you can get by with smaller antennas as you go higher in frequency because the path loss between fixed area antennas decreases as you go up in frequency. And this, I, this shows you some examples of how small you can make the antennas. I, I figure that just about everyone can set up a couple meter dish, a little over six feet dish in their backyards. You can put it in your front yard, as a matter, a six foot dish, or off your ba balcony. That's enough to, to make contacts. It's not gonna, you can hide it away when, when you're not operating, you know, wheel it away or 
put it behind something. But if you go up to 10 gigahertz, you can get by with less than a, and I'll show you that, less, a, a dish that's less than a, me, a meter in, uh, in size. This is a one meter dish portable set up at three, uh, 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 three centimeters, 10 gigahertz, that's 10,368 megahertz. And it was, it was in operations for a demonstration at uh, one of the VHF meetings done by W5LUA. And it just shows you what you can get with, uh, get by with. And, and have a fairly, you can hear your own echoes with this type of setup and work a, 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 a large amount of, a, a majority of the stations that are, are active with, with a, a one meter dish. No, I don't think so. I think that there's a lot of surplus dishes around, so I'm pretty sure that was a commercial dish. Most of the dishes you see are commercial because they're so readily available. And as you go higher in frequency, you want to have a really good, a good surface. The accuracy becomes important. At 1296, the accuracy really isn't that important. You can get by with a, some wood sticks that are bent and screening, and you, you don't lose very much. But as you go higher and higher in frequency, your wavelength you know, is proportional to the frequency. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the, the accuracy of the surface becomes more important. Fortunately, there are a lot of dishes around, almost in many cases, for the, for the taking, if you take them away. I know so many people have said, oh, they see a dish someplace, and they say, oh, that dish is laying there. Do you want, to, want, want that dish? And people will say, no, please take it away. They're happy uh, that you come and, and take it. They'll almost pay you to take the dish away. So this is just another example. This is a fellow who is regularly active. I just talked to him uh, a, a couple weeks ago on, uh, on 3400, uh, the ham band that you, if you look at your ha microwave ham bands, and I'm sure that's not dripping off everyone's lips, lips over here. You know, you all know, I'm sure 144 and probably 432 and maybe 1296, but you go above that, you got 2300, which is 13 centimeters, then you have nine centimeters, then you have six centimeters, and you have three centimeters, each getting smaller and smaller. So this is a, a fellow who feels he's very limited in his, his home, you can see it here, and he has a 2.4 uh, meter dish. I'm sorry, a 1.4 meter dish, right? Uh, yeah, 1.4 meter dish. And this is an example of him on 13 centimeters. He uses this same dish on 1296. It's a little small, but he makes contacts on nine centimeters, 3400, where I, I worked him just recently. And there's, it's really not that fancy. I mean, he's, he's got this mounted in concrete with a nice pole here. Uh, but it, 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 if you picture this, it's not a, a real, a real I say mechanical effort to put something up is probably what a lot of you, less than what a lot of you have invested in the tower in your backyard. Get your antennas up in the air. So if we go on, okay, now we talk about small dishes. Here's the ultimate. Uh, this is a half meter dish, okay? Uh, about 20 inches, right? A less than 20 inch dish. And this is PA0 from Holland, who was demonstrating, this was at a, a meeting, he brought this dish over, and he was demonstrating his reception. Oh, this is a big signal, I gotta admit. DL0SHF, he runs a beacon on three centimeters. It's on all the time. And he's running about 50 watts in a fairly good sized dish up there. But he, he brought this to the meeting, and he was showing that with his small half meter dish, you could hear the CW signal. And I'm talking about CW, no digital fancy processing or anything, you could literally here, the signal uh, with this 0.5 meter dish. And here is another, and these are just examples of a microwave. This is uh, OZ1FF, who's over in Denmark. He's active with a 1.8 meter dish, and he's got 15 watts. And he makes contacts up at uh, three centimeters with that uh, very minimal type of system. Now, I guess the ultimate of small size is, you, you all know about Yagi's. Everyone's seen Yagi antennas, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What do you think a Yagi would be like at three centimeters? I remember one time this fellow built up a Yagi and he brought a little cigar can, a little, you know, these long plastic uh, like cigar containers in it. And he had, a, he had a short three centimeter Yagi he built up inside of that, okay? Well, uh, here is an example. It's a Yagi, and you can see the details here. See this? It's a very small Yagi. This fellow 
built up a long Yagi. It's 80 centimeters long. The elements are very, very small. Uh, uh, 72 elements on this, and this is the Yagi. This is the close-up of, uh, of the Yagi there. You got a, you got a piece of, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, it looks like a piece of plastic here. I, I'm sure it was a, some sort of insulated material. And then mounted on that, he's got these little wires for the Yagi elements, okay? And he, he was showing that you can receive EME signals from other hams using just the Yagi at three centimeters. So uh, believe it or not, there you are, three centimeter EME with a Yagi antenna. And not that long a Yagi. I'm sorry? How accurate is supposed to be element with a Yagi at three centimeters? Around a few millimeters? Uh, how long? Accuracy. Oh, the accuracy. You got to, You can figure that I would say you want to be within about 5%, okay? It depends on, on the Yagi uh, design you have. Some are more sensitive and you want the last, the last, but you want to be careful. You know, I, I would say about 5%. Some might say 2% at uh, 2 meters or of the length of the, of the Yagi elements. So what do you need when we really get down to the details? Besides the antenna and a little power, what do you need? Well, you, you need a way to track the moon. That's, for a lot of people, that's the most difficult part. They get the antennas real easy. They go out and buy the transmitter and receiver today. You can buy a complete system for 10 gigahertz, the, at least the pieces to put together. Uh, it's not difficult to get the equipment together. Uh, but you've got to figure out how to track the moon. I see more people spending time tracking the moon. They make a, a real science project out of it. You don't, for a small antenna, you don't have to because if you have to, you, you can literally go out there and manually point the beam, the antenna to get started. And then after you, you start to point it manually, you get tired, so you'll add a rotator to rotate it horizontally and you'll correct the elevation. And then you'll add, add an elevation rotator. You don't have to go all out and have the fanciest system that's self-tracking. Uh, for a small antenna, you know, you can correct maybe once every 15 minutes. For a bigger antenna, you need to correct more, more often. But this shows you uh, uh, it's not difficult, as I say, for a small an uh, antenna. And I'm suggesting, though I, I like to operate CW, and I'm not suggesting that we give up CW, but I find a lot of people who first got their license by not knowing the code, they get on and operate digital on EME. They use a digital system so they don't have to know the code. They just look at their computer, and the computer tells them uh, the station that they're, they're working. And you can, on a screen, you can see where that station is. And that's part of the technique, because you want to tune the station in. You want to see if it's drifting or stuff. This is part, all a part of, uh, of, of Joe K1JT's software. So this is a, a signal here. This is actually a show illustrating this here. There's that station I showed you who was in the uh, South Pole. DL, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, DP1POL. And that just shows his, his antenna and signal strength uh, in terms of the display. But to track him, he was not using any, any automatic tracking. He just went out there, and every few minutes, he went out and adjusted the Yagi antenna to keep it in the right position. So if we go on and look at it, and I guess well, as this goes, you'll see one of the things that the software that Joe gives you, the, the WSJC software, it ha tells you where to point your antenna. So you don't have to do anything. It tells you right in the software, point your antenna at so many degrees, so many elevation. So that there's no, you don't have to worry about looking that up. It's given to you there all the time. And so all you have to do is how to, in, where to, how high is 10 degrees or how high is 20 degrees if you're looking at elevation. And you can do this very easily. I mean, if you're on a budget, you can go and make, draw up your own ProTac tractor. You know, you, you, you need something that reads out angle. And you can literally make this up with a pen and, and, and carefully, or you can go out and buy these, these things that, uh, you know, when you get school supplies. And you hang a, a pendulum down, and as you move your antenna, that tells you your elevation. There are a lot of fancier things you can do. You can buy things that read out directly in degrees. You can go down to the uh, local hardware store, and they have, have uh, levels that read out digitally. And you can actually go into the level and 
and connect up to it and read out at a distance what the, what the level does. Though a lot of people, what they do, one of the simplest things, if you want to do things really easy, they just get a television camera. How much does a TV camera cost today with the, all the computer TV cameras, right? You can get, buy them for literally $15, $20. And they just buy a couple cameras and they point the camera at the elevation display. They point the camera at the readout if it's, if it's a, uh, a protractor. And then they watch it inside their shack and they adjust to the, the numbers there. The same thing you can make is a compass rose. And you have a pointer. And as you move the antenna, you see what the angle is. And I'll tell you, one of the most accurate ways, it's not going to get blown up by lightning. I've, I've lost my readouts and I've had a lightning strike. And they're expensive to replace. Uh, but I actually have on my dish for emergencies, I have a big, big circle, very carefully uh, laid out and a television camera on it. So if I, in an emergency and I want to work someone and I have something go wrong with my readout systems, I can fall back. It's a fallback. It's interesting. Uh, one time I went to Mount Palomar. You know Mount Palomar? That's the big, uh, yeah, it's an optical telescope. 200 inch optical telescope was the biggest for many years in the world. One time I went and visited that and you got this huge dome with this uh, optical telescope. It's a refractor telescope, so it's a 200 inch mirror on the thing. But around the edge of the telescope, they have got laid out, you know what? Degrees. And when this thing moves, the, the whole thing moves as it's pointed, and they read it out with a television camera, uh, the degrees right on the edge of this thing. Uh, you know, that was old technology. That was around for a long time, so it's old technology, but that's what they were doing. Uh, so there are a lot of things you can do easy. You don't have to do things always hard. For the transmitter side, and I'm using this as kind of a, a rough measure, 50 watts is a, for 1296, you get a 50 watt amplifier, and they're readily available today. There's a lot of, of, of places that make these amplifiers and not for sky high dollars. One of the places is W6QPL. He got into this and he was so popular that he, he turned, it turned it into a business. So he, he sells amplifiers. Uh, there are a couple of, of European companies, in fact, more than a couple, that sell 1296 amplifiers and support people. And I have a, 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 a surprising statement here. You won't hear this from most EMEers. But what does that say there? Can you read that? Don't need a preamp. You don't need a preamp. Why don't you need a preamp when you're getting started? Well, if you're going to get on, and you got the small transmitter, right? And you got this antenna, but your transmitter is small. There are a lot of stations with big power, right? So if you have a receiver, it's got to work, obviously. But you don't need the fanciest preamp because the station you're working is going to have 10 dB more than you. He's going to be running, or she's going to be running, the most possible power. And you, you don't need that really weak signal because they're going to make up for it. They got to hear you. They got to have a really good, good set of ears to receive you. But at your end, when you're starting off, you start off, if you don't have the, the best preamp, the, the other guy is going to make it up. Now, as you get into this, you're going to, oh, I worked him, I worked him, I worked him. You want to work someone else, right? So then you're going to get yourself a better preamp. But to start off, uh, the fellow Bodo who went around with that one Yagi and ran 80 watts, he used no preamp. And, and his argument was, I don't need a preamp because the stations I'm going to work are all, are all running a lot more than 80 watts, so I'm going to hear them if they're going to hear me. So that takes care of the receiver. Uh, well, what else do you need on this? Well, you need a way to detect weak signals. And of course, CW is not bad. It really is very good. I'm doing this here because I spent many times with my eyes literally closed trying to dig out that really weak signal in the, in the, the noise. But the, the digital system, when you're starting out and you don't know CW, works very, very well on there's a bunch of different forms of, uh, of JT from the stuff they use on HF, you may be using on HF, up to the stuff that they use on, on three centimeters. The, the, the form you need depends on the frequency you're operating at, because it has to do with stability and vibrations. I'll talk a little bit about this, but you can use JT, and the, the numbers I'm talking about, 50 watts, one Yagi, uh, a small dish. I, I'm assuming you're going to use JT to start with, okay? Uh, now. JT is a piece of software that you download for free. 
you know, Joe is, is, is a fabulous guy. You know, he's never made any money out of this, figure out how to do this. He's, he's interested in changing amateur radio, and he has. Tremendous impact on amateur radio. But you, don't, you just go to the internet, look up under W1JT, there's a, a web page there, and you just download the latest, doesn't cost you anything, down there with all sorts of instruction and all sorts of help. Now, everyone, I'm gonna assume, I always say don't assume anything, but I think this is a fairly safe assumption. Almost everyone here has a computer, right? So you download this on your computer, but how do you get your computer hooked up to your radio equipment? A lot of you have your computer hooked up, but not everybody. So I'm gonna assume that there, there is nothing, not, that there are a lot of people who don't have their computer hooked up to their radio equipment. Well, you, you don't need a special box. People will try and sell you that, that you need a special interface and stuff like that. But all you need is a sound card, and virtually every computer today that's sold comes with a sound card. So you, ne you need a sound card. And literally, you take the speaker output of the sound card and hook that to the microphone. You gotta adjust your level carefully, but you don't need any special transformers or isolation. That will drive the microphone, the speaker output of your sound card, without anything special. Just be a little careful, you adjust your levels right. And on the opposite side, on the receive side, you take the receive side out and you plug it into the microphone jack of your sound card. Again, you wanna adjust your levels carefully uh, and you don't need anything else. And now you say, well, I wanna turn the thing on and off. Well, when you first start out, if you don't wanna put any effort in at all, you can use your Vox on, the, on your transceiver or this, whatever you're using as your, your station. I happen to use a TS2000X, which is, it comes for, 12, for 432. It, it, everything's there and you gotta get a separate module, but not bad, it's quite stable. I use that. So the, T, the, the 2000 and a lot of the other transceivers come along, they have a Vox control. So I, you turn my computer, when the computer comes on, boom, the audio comes out, it turns the rig on. And that turns my, my system on. So I operate on Tropo or the moon, it doesn't matter, it handles it. So uh, you can just use that. Now that's dangerous sometimes because JT is very nice and the 2000 has, has fixed delays and things like that because you really don't wanna turn the, go to transmit while the receiver is still connected to the antenna, right? So you like to have some synchronization and safety. Well, you can very easily use a serial port. Now this is harder to get in the old days. Everyone, all the computers had a serial port. But you can get a USB to serial port converter and you get a hold of your serial port and you can take the voltage off your serial port, go and buy a read relay and a, a, a typical read relay will operate from the voltage that you get on the serial port. You don't need a transistor, you don't need anything. You just hook the read relay up. And then you use that to control your transmitter on and off. So uh, you can do this really very inexpensively. Just uh, with a single read relay and some connectors. And this kind of shows you a picture. I, I showed you something similar to this. I guess this is the same shot I had before, but you, this is a, a screenshot. This is frequency. As you dial your receiver, this moves across the frequency because this is based on the audio out. You're looking at the audio out of your receiver on your, on your computer. Comes in the sound card. And so you can see, ah, there's a station there. Okay, and then if you go and you actually do is you take your mouse and you click right on this. When you see a station, you click on it, it jumps, this little cursor here will jump to that and it'll start decoding and it'll tell you if you got a station there or not, uh, what you're receiving. And I can go, there are a lot of, of, of additional add-ons and you know, I'll use the word doodads, you know, you, all sorts of extra things you can do, but this, this is just the uh, basics here. And J, WSJT gives you the information, the info you need. It tells you where to point the moon. That's right over here. Uh, that's giving you the azimuth and the elevation settings. It tells you what the Doppler shift is. Ah, Doppler shift. What's Doppler shift? Now, this is high school science, right? But uh, everyone here, who does not know what Doppler shift is? Be honest. Anyone here never heard of Doppler shift? 
Now, you listen to uh, a train go by. I know you have, right? Right? Yeah. And you ever hear the whistle of a train? Yes. Okay. As that train goes by, does the whistle stay constant? No. No, it changes, okay? That is Doppler shift. When you produce a sine wave, whether it's acoustic or it's radio electromagnetic, Doppler, same principle applies, whether it's sound or electromagnetic. When something is moving relative to you that's producing a signal, in the case of the whistle of a train, you hear this, ee, whatever it is, I'm not very good at making sounds. I'm even worse at singing. <laughs> uh, my wife's in two choirs, so I'm really in bad shape here. <laughs> but when you listen to a tone, you know, and it could be a musical instrument, if that moves relative to you, is it, it moves towards you, it goes higher in frequency, if it goes away from you, it goes lower in frequency. So the problem we have with the moon is it's moving relative to the Earth. When the moon rises, it's coming towards you. When the moon gets way overhead, no Doppler shift because it's, it's standing still relative to you where you're going, right? As this moon starts to go this way and set, now the moon's going away, so the frequency goes lower. So if at, as you go higher in frequency, these shifts can be very significant. At two meters, if you operate two meter EME, it's, it's almost negligible, okay? At 432, it's, you know, it's like 500 hertz or so. At 1296, you can get a couple kilohertz of, of change, particularly at the extremes, it goes out to three kilohertz. So at 1296, you definitely need to correct because you, you'll hear the difference in the, in the tone, in the setting of it. At 1290, excuse me, at three centimeters, you know how much the Doppler is? Over 30 kilohertz. You know what 30 kilohertz is like? It's really weird. You know, you work in the sky and you gotta tune 30 kilohertz away to find them. <laughs> and it's amazing because he's there. You know, the physics works. It really is amazing. So you, you want to correct for your Doppler shift at the higher frequencies. Another thing you have is this thing called polarization. And I say polarization is not needed at 1296. Well, that's why people are all, if you're circular, you don't have to worry about what your polarization is. And every, the majority of people are, are circular. If you start off and you say, well, I'm, you know, I got this Yagi I've been using at 1296, operating some of the VHF contests, working on you know, terrestrial on the ground, typical VHF, and you want to use that Yagi on EME or you operate satellites, it'll work fine. You're, you're going to lose 3 dB. But you're still going to make contacts. You'll be surprised. You're going to be able to make contacts. Then when you want to get more, then you worry about how I get, go to circular. But if everyone's circular, it doesn't matter how the, how the Yagi is oriented, right? You don't have to worry about it. There's two things that occur with polarization. I think I have a slide on that. Let me see. We go beyond this, and I'll talk about this. No, I'll get to it someplace. But this just, as you go higher in frequency, there are other modes. This is JT4F that's popular, and there's another one that's, I, I don't think I have on here, QRA64, that are designed for use at the higher frequencies, because the secret behind JT is it's, it's receiving signals in a very, very narrow bandwidth, okay? But when you go up to three centimeters where the Doppler is really moving, you have to have, it gets very difficult to keep that signal in the bandwidth. So you need uh, techniques that allow you to compensate for the fact that the signal is moving around so much. And so uh, Joe developed uh, some special modes like JT4, which works pretty well, and now there's what's called QRA64D is what people are using. I, don't, I say I don't have the 64 there. QRA64D, it's relatively new in the last couple years, but people are using this. You don't, this is not 1296, this is just if you're going way up into the higher microwave bands, you start to use these type of, of techniques. Uh, this is a, a picture of a, of a signal on uh, JT4F, and you, what you actually see is three, three lines, or, excuse me, four lines when you, when you see the, uh, the signal on JT4F. And it doesn't take much, as I said, here is a, something that's in the order of not even a meter dish, this is a friend of mine, G3WDG. He has to go to Hungary every so often on business, so he takes his, his system, his three-centimeter system with him, and he operates from Hungary, you know, right, right from the uh, hotel that he's uh, staying at with his, his small little dish. It's, ver it's not a, a big deal to bring this with him. And so this is his setup operating portable at, at uh, 
three centimeters. One of the nice things that is in the JT is this thing called an echo mode. So you want to test your system. And if you've got a small signal with low power, you're not going to hear your echoes. You know, I have a big dish. I run a lot of power. I go da, da, da. And even if I say hello on the microphone, you know, I hear that hello coming back. But if you've got this low power station, small antenna, chances are you are not going to hear your echo. Uh, you use the JT mode. And it is kind of like that system I talked about that was developed in Hungary, the first tier echoes where they repeated the signal. It does the same thing. It sends the signal repeatedly. It knows where to look. It adds those together. And it gives you the ability to hear a very, very weak signal. So you can hear signals on the, using the echo mode that you couldn't even communicate with someone with. But it gives you an idea. Oh, my system's working, yeah, I'm getting echoes, but it's a little weak, I gotta do this to improve it. It's a way of getting feedback when you first start up. Uh, and you don't have to have anyone around, it, it works really very, very well. Not, uh, from my point of view, not enough people make, uh, take advantage of it. So I talked about what else you should know. I started to talk about Doppler and how Doppler works and moves with frequency. When you get into this on 1296, and it's all in JAT, it tells you what your own Doppler is. But when you're working a, a station, that station is going to have a different Doppler than you. Because the moon is moving towards you, let's say. Let's say I'm working a station on the, this way on the horizon. So I'm working, let's say, a station in Europe. The station in Europe is going to have the moon moving away from him. The frequency is going to be going down. You're going to have the moon moving towards you. Frequency is going up. The Doppler you hear, and he hears on you, by the way, is the combination of those two uh, there. So what you need to know is what the mutual Doppler is. And you see here it says dx. This is set up, so it's not a good example. I'm, I'm showing you here because I don't have a, probably have a, I have a local dx station. But the DX Doppler may be different than your self Doppler. The self Doppler is where you would tune to hear your own echoes. The DX Doppler is where you tune to hear the distant station. And it's all built in there, so it tells you where to listen. Then uh, there's this thing called polarization rotation. As I said, polarization rotation, electronic polarization rotation, Faraday, is nil. That means that there's none there at 1296. It's very, very small. And what's Faraday? Because I haven't really talked about that. Well, Faraday was a really phenomenal early inventor, an early scientist, I guess you have to call him, uh, who got involved with electromagnetism uh, back in the 19th century. One of the, one of the people, we remember him because we talk about Faraday's. Uh, so. Faraday was the one who discovered this effect. Turns out that if you have a linear polarized wave, he did this with light, because you have polarization with light. And light is just the same thing as your radio transmitter, just higher in frequency. But when you put light through a magnetic field in a dielectric type material, it gets rotated. So you have kind of the same situation. When a signal travels through the atmosphere, it's rotated. And Faraday is the one who first observed this effect in relation to light, but we refer to that as Faraday rotation, because the wave is rotated. When it goes out to the moon, it's rotated. When it goes back from the moon, it's also rotated the same way. The lower in frequency you go, the more Faraday rotation you have. As you go up in frequency, Faraday rotation goes away. So by the time you're at 1296, you don't have a problem with Faraday rotation. At 432, you have a problem with Faraday rotation. A lot of people have the ability to rotate the polarization of their antenna on 432, so they can optimize. Not everybody. Some people just live with it. They just, they just you know, take their odds. Some days the signals will be good, and some days they'll be not so good because the Faraday rotation may be cross-polarized. Two meters, Faraday moves like crazy because it's more rotation. It, and that, that's an advantage on two meters because maybe in a given hour of operating, you might be aligned, and next you'll be unaligned. It's a, it's a problem. But it, it is actually less of a problem than 432. If you operate 432, I have a rotator on my feet of my 432, 
antenna, and people run linear pole on 432 to uh, when I operate it. But we're talking about 1296 here. By the time you get to 1296, there's virtually no Faraday rotation. Well, you're probably going to say, why then are you using circular pole? Why don't you just use linear pole? Because you don't have this problem with the polarization getting rotated when you go through the atmosphere. Why, why, use, uh, why use circular pole? Well, there's another reason that your polarization gets moved, and this is called geometric pole. If you're horizontally polarized in, in Europe and you're horizontally polarized in the, let's say, the United States, and you both point at the, at the moon, if you follow the, the, the coordinate as you hit the moon, the reflection, the, the way that's reflected, and I'm coming out horizontal, I hit the moon and I come back this way to the station here in the US. As you can see what I'm trying to show you here, this is horizontal, but the time it gets reflected back here, the signal is vertical, okay? So if we're both horizontal, we're gonna be cross-poled. And uh, that's a, a, a problem. The way you get around this is you calculate what the polarization is, and, and it, 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 you're told what it is here, and then you just move your antenna. It doesn't change. It's, it's, it's very slow moving effect. It's just from the geometry. So it doesn't change very rapidly. You can literally me mechanically go up there, change your feed, and have it the right polarization. But you really don't have to worry about it anyhow because most people are running circular, as I tried to explain, and that eliminates the problem. But if you're not aligned, it is a difficulty. I could go on and talk about this because this is one of the things you deal with people and getting everyone to coordinate. For some reason, polar people start operating on three centimeters linearly polarized. Every other microwave band, they operate circular. 1296, 13 centimeters, six centimeters, nine centimeters. They all operate circular pole, okay? What do they operate on three centimeters? Linear pole, right? So you got a problem. Got to either adjust your pole. What most people do is a, the, the Europeans operate vertical and the US stations operate horizontal because that takes care of a lot of the geometric uh, polarization. There are people that want to get, try for years to get everyone together and agree and let's all switch to circular, but it never happens. Any phasing issues? Uh, not really, not, not, not really. Obviously, if you got smaller antennas, you phase them, you gotta be more careful. So, I talked about rotation in Faraday. I told you more than you need to know. Uh, obviously, the frequency should be stable, and most of the rigs are pretty stable today, and you can, there, you can get GPS locks. They're relatively inexpensive today that you can hook up and use a, a GPS standard to fix your, your, your frequency. Uh -huh. Does the angle at which one hits the moon have any effect on its transmission? It's, and also, do any of the phases of the moon affect transmission? Those are good questions, very good questions. First, uh, the moon surface is not smooth, right? So stuff comes out of this, and this is a real radar problem. Like if you send the signal to an airplane, right? Does the airplane have a flat surface to you? No, so you know, if it's round for the most part, it can be this way and that way. So the signal that hits that surface is reflected, angle of instant equals the angle of reflection. Remember that from maybe physics or high school science? Uh, you have a mirror, the, as you point out here, the, the angle you, hit something is. But in the case of the moon where everything is all over the place, you get a scattering of the signal off the moon. So you don't get a really a coherent reflection like you get off a plate, okay? So everything goes all over the place. And so you get less gain, that's part of the loss of the moon. It op operates uh, like a radar, when a radar has the same problem. When it hits something, it's very unlikely that the surface is gonna be at right angles to where you're hitting it. And if you, you're, you got something over here and you, you, you can see you, if it was flat, you hit it, all the energy would go this way and very little would come back to you, right? So you have the scattering problem. Your things are not perfectly smooth and it scatters back to you. That limits the amount of signal you get if you look at, the, at, at radar. And the same thing applies to the moon. It's interesting that when the Apollo, this is a great time here with the Apollo uh, situation, the Apollo you know, astronauts were on the moon, they left these reflectors on the, on the moon to reflect the light back. And they're relatively small, and the idea is you get a laser, you find them, you hit them, and they give you a signal back. I used to think 
wasn't thinking very well, yet, oh, I'm sure, oh yeah, these must be, they just have some good reflective plates up there on the moon, right? Flat plates, right? But you have the same problem you're pointing out. You, you hit it, uh, you know, if it's a flat plate, depending on where you are, the angle of the moon relative to you, the signal's not gonna come back to you. That surface is not gonna necessarily be right, right ahead of you. So they have something there that's a, it's like a tetrahedron. It's a, it, it's a triangular or pyramidal shaped surface. And you can show that no matter what you come into that, the signal comes back in the same direction as it, as it comes to. It's an optical, but it applies to radio too. Uh, any electromagnetic, when you set up this equilateral structure here, the wave comes this way, it bounces this way, and it ends up bouncing back to you. And that's what they have on the moon for the laser reflections to take care of the problem you're talking about right there. With regard to the phases of the moon, there really is no real uh, effect due to the, uh, the phase of the moon, except it's easier if you're trying to optically find the moon when it's there. There is some very minor issues with the noise temperature of the moon. And I, I, I you know, you will get me going here. I can talk for two or three hours. I don't want to get too specific here. So some of these things I'd rather talk about offline or after I can ex explain better. But the, the quick answer is it doesn't have any effect. Okay. Uh, uh, you've been talking about amateur radio applications for all this uh, for the past hour or so. Yes. Now, question, have there been, there are lots of high power radio emitters on Earth, ranging from UHF television transmitters that are over a megawatt to FM broadcast stations. Has there been any perception over the years of incidental signals being reflected off the moon? Not intentionally, but large enough to see antennas. Is it possible? To absolutely, abs, 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 absolutely. You know, the the story is, and I, you know, that uh, the, the the funding for Arecibo, you know, the big telescope, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, yeah, that part of that money came from our uh, NSA, because I, I've been told, and I'm pretty sure that this is correct, that they use the Arecibo telescope and these other big telescopes to pick up incidental signals from countries that they wanted to basically spy upon, pick up. And if you had a big enough antenna, the signals there from the moon, you'll pick it up. You'll see the TV signals, you'll hear the FM radio, uh, whatever. You know, it's just gotta be big enough and you gotta have enough gain. And, and so I am told that they used Arecibo. I don't know what the Chinese are doing. You know, again, this technology uh, and I got to respect people for it, but you know, Arecibo used to be the biggest telescope, right? You know where the biggest telescope is now? China, China right. It's five times the size of Arecibo, right? Yeah. They built up there. Now, I, I, no one ever talked about that, but I wonder if their they're equivalent are of the CIA or <laughs> NSA is using that to, to listen for signals from the Earth. Interesting question you brought up there. But though, th that definitely is, is possible, and the answer is it's been done or is being done, for all I know. So I've just reinvented the wheel. Now, now, we all do, right? That's the, one of the great things. And it's lucky we do it, because the wheel gets forgotten a lot. <laughs> uh, so I talked about stability. You need to know your stability, obviously, close enough to find the station you want. Uh, these things aren't too hard. There are beacons on the, on the moon. 1296 is the best one. There's a beacon that's been on for, I think, it's 12, 13 years now, continuously. It's in Belgium. The moon is a 10 degrees above the horizon. The beacon's on uh, in Belgium. It's a very nice beacon. It doesn't take much to hear it. It's a, I think it's a, 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 a three, four meter dish that's set up there with uh, about three, 400 watts of power. And it, it sends both CW and a JT signal uh, out. It's, a, it's been very, very dependable. Uh, the guys who do it really deserve a, a, a nice vote of thanks for, you know, they put the time in to keep this thing going and always on. Uh, with JT, my comment here just says that you want to know your time accurately because there's a window that you're timing and we use these digital modes. But you can do that just by connecting up to the internet and set your timing. Well, here's a point that is kind of interesting. You know, the moon is an elliptical orbit. Most of your planetary objects are not circular, they're elliptical. So there are times that the moon is closer and there are times that the moon is further apart. And there's about a two dB variation. 
between your strong signals and your weak signals. In fact, right now, the moon is kind of far away. It's not at a, an optimum, optimum position. I, I say that because there are a lot of people going on tonight because of the anniversary of the, uh, the moon landing. So there are a bunch of big dishes on, uh, one in Perth, one in, uh, in uh, no, actually there's a couple in, in, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, all over the place there are, are a, a lot of big signals. One group in, in uh, Holland is sending slow scan TV off the moon uh, with pictures of the, of the landing. So anyhow, you, you like to, and if the, the date today wasn't very propitious, because uh, it's, 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 the moon is, is far away, not close. But you do have this 2 dB variation. So you have people choosing when they're going to operate on. Part of it is when the, the moon is close. because so They'll pick up 2 dB. And we can go on here. I, I think I sh went over this already. This just shows you some more of the small signal uh, information. And this particular system I showed you is available for the receiver. He's using one of the, the dongles directly to receive uh, three centimeters, 10 gigahertz. And it, I'm not talking about the price of the dish, but the, 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 the dongle system he's using is $55 to receive moon signals off the moon. So that's, I thought, quite impressive. And uh, I think I'm getting close to the end here. If we go one more here, I mentioned the beacons that there's a beacon on 1296. This is, is the 1296 ON0 EME beacon since 2012, continuously. And then the DL0 SHF, he's, he's pretty continuously, almost near continuously. Uh, that is on on three centimeters. And if we go here, I always say the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? How good does it taste? And this just shows you, I, I got on the back of a, a friend of mine who uh, K3MF uh, not too long ago, maybe two years ago this was taken. I said, ah, oh, you've got all this stuff. Take your tropo antennas. And he was operating two meter EME. I said, just take your, your tropo 45 loop Yagi, put it on your two meter EME array at a two meter EMA array, and you'll see you'll be able to work people on 1296. So he, he had a 60 watt tropo transmitter uh, he was using there on tropo. And he had a 2000, I use a 2000X. So this is his setup. He just went outside, put the loop Yagi on his, uh, on his uh, antenna, and this just shows. The digital signals, this was my reception of him and his reception of, of me. The two lines here is uh, a, a, a coded acknowledgment. So that we had a QSO. So you can do it. Doesn't take much. How much power you run the I run about 500 watts on, it's really more like 400 watts at the, at the antenna. I have, I'm not a, I have a 28 foot dish. I started off with a homemade dish in 1971. I put up a, uh, a 20 foot wooden stress dish up when I moved down to where I am. The uh, dish was up there for a couple years and I gave it to the Mount Airy VHF Society Club. They took it over and operated with it for a few years. I think they finally got hit by a hurricane or something and, uh, and it was damaged and I, was given this 28-foot dish by a friend that was basically cut up. They were cutting it up in, at, uh, at Bell Labs, Crawford Hill. And I took it home, and uh, it was amazing. Back then, this was 1973. One thing I see is I get a lot, I seem to go a lot slower as I've gotten older, you know. We had that dish up in a, in a year. Today, it would be 10 years. Uh, I don't know what it is with, with time. And time goes by faster, if you haven't noticed that. Uh, but uh, I was very lucky, and I've had that up since 1973. But you don't have to have a 28-foot dish. Has, has, has there been any other experimentation with other celestial bodies in terms of the uh, reflected signal? Yeah, the trouble is they're very weak. There's uh, a group uh, in Germany, which is almost a near commercial. They have a... Uh, I think they have a, a 35 or 40 foot dish, okay? And I, I'm not the biggest ham dish around. Uh, you know, there's a, a 50 footer in New York State. 
there's a 50 footer in, uh, in Finland, there is a uh, almost a 50 footer, a 48 footer. These are ham, and they're not observatory right. dishes in, in, in Switzerland. So there are a lot of really big dishes that are not commercial dishes, but hams that are put up. And a lot of 28 foot dishes like I have, there are a lot of those surplus around. So uh, the, I think I'm, I'm forgetting the answer to the question you were asking before. Uh, Any other terrestrial Oh, I'm sorry. I, was, I got into this thing about big dishes. And excuse me for losing my sorry. train here. No, it's, I'm sorry. Uh, there was some work by this group to try and, and get bounces off of Venus. It's much, much, much weaker. And they think they, with some statistical stuff, that they, they, they found uh, an indication of reception of the echoes off of Venus. And that's not 100% clear uh, on it. It's, it's, when you look at Mars, you look at Venus, it's very difficult. There was some work done back, you're a young enough guy probably to remember the ECHO satellite, which was a, uh, a, a, a satellite, conductive satellite, aluminum uh, foil satellite sphere they put up back in the early days of satellites that you could reflect signals off. And a lot of hams, including myself, try to receive it. It's 5 dB weak, weaker than the moon. Uh, so uh, there's not really much else besides the moon <laughs> right now. But you, you have commercial satellites. You have the amateur satellites. You get someone here to talk about the, the, the satellite that's over the Indian Ocean. Everyone knows about the satellite over the Indian Ocean, the ham satellite. OK. Yeah, very nice. Unfortunately, we can't receive it here, though. This is just another follow-up. I, I, besides uh, Bermuda, just a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity, again, for business uh, to go to Puerto Rico. So uh, I, I, I set up in uh, not, uh, for, I went from Puerto Rico. Actually, I was there on Puerto Rico in business. We went to the Virgin Islands, because Puerto Rico has been on quite a bit, and set up in, in Puerto Rico with my, my little wooden stress dish and, and, and there. So uh, just show you, that, that's one of the, the fun things is to go out. So to close this thing up, wrap this thing up, you know, the, the, the moon bounce is a fascinating uh, propagation. Uh, there are a lot of factors that make it less than a sure thing. You've got the fact that it changes with position that the noise background behind the moon changes. These are all factors that make this thing not a sure thing, but make it, make it interesting enough that you're not certain you're going to make a QSO all the time. The sun can be close to the moon. The Doppler shift moves the frequency. Faraday polarization. You got this thing called librations that I am not going into, but the moon rocks all the time relative to the Earth, which gives you a modulation on the, on the signals that gets, tends to get worse as you go in frequency. And all these things affect uh, whether you're going to have a QSO or not. So if we go on here, so in conclusion, EME, these factors that I just talked about make EME a challenge. It's not a, a sure thing. On 23 centimeters, you don't need a lot. I'm here I'm saying 50 watts. And a, uh, a Yagi is all you need. It's pretty easy with big stations, but there's still a lot to it. You know, accurate frequency, stability, tracking the moon, all those things go in it, even with a small station. Uh, so there is still a challenge. And with a weak dish station, you got all the above, and you must understand how to use JT. It's not, you know, people think, oh, the computer does everything. The computer doesn't do everything. It, there's, there's a technique like anything uh, using the digital modes, and they use it effectively. So that's all part of it that make it uh, exciting and fun. Thank you. There are, there are a lot of contests for moon bounce. Uh, yeah, the reason I bring it up is that the presentation focused mainly more on, on 1296. I mean, as far as two meter goes, it's just a lot harder. No, two, meter, hard. two meters is the most popular band of EME. I'm, as I said, starting off, I'm, this fellow's been interested all along. For some reason, I got interested in the higher frequencies. Right, right. And uh, I've operated two meters. I know a lot of people 
operate two meters. Uh, two meters tends to be, you know, on the negative side, it tends to be very noisy. I have problems already with noise and TV stations that I can see from my, my house and FM stations. So it's, you, you do have a noise problem on two meters, but most people have two meter equipment. Two meters is by far the most activity is on it. Well, I would say, again, a, two, a, a long two meter Yagi. Now, when I talk a, a long two meter Yagi, you're talking about 10 times the length of the Yagi on 432 proportionally, because you're about 10 to 1 between 144 and 1296. So, where someone can get by with a, a six foot Yagi on maybe 1296 minimum, and I really, most people are using more like 10, 12 foot Yagis, maybe you want a 30 foot Yagi on two meters. For good, for good success, and and power. and power, power. But people do make contacts with uh, a few hundred watts. Digital has really changed the the name of the game. So it, you know, if you have a nice a single Yagi, you want to put the time in, and you have a couple hundred watts, even a brick. I think you'll find that you'll, you'll people you'll be able to work because there's really big stations on two meters, just like on 1296. 1296 is the next most popular band. What happens as you're penetrating the various layers of the ionosphere and out through space with refraction and reflection. Do you always need to compensate the angle of elevation for that? No, no, there's virtually no, no matter what any of the bands, there's virtually no effect from bending in the atmosphere on your radio signal. No, very, very little. Maybe at, you sometimes see some effects right at the horizon, okay? When you're bending over the edge, you know. You can hear a station a little bit longer than you're supposed to, but it's very minimal. Two things that overlap. You mentioned the surface of the moon creates some noise, and you were talking at, towards the end here about the noise floor. Yep. What is the typical noise floor that you hear? The, well, I can't talk about a noise floor because there's a bunch of factors that go into it. The, the noise floor is made up of the noise that your receiver adds, and then the noise that your antenna picks up uh, on top of it. And the reason that the moon generates noise is because it's not cold. The noise has a core temperature. And you can see that core temperature. In fact, one of the ways when I'm operating on three centimeters with my big dish, and I, it's not very good. It shouldn't work at all at three centimeters. But I look at the moon noise. And I can see the moon noise. And I can tell I'm on the moon by just looking at the pickup of the excess noise that the, that the moon gives you. So that becomes a factor in the equations of, of what you're going to receive because Depending on the beam width of your antenna, you're going to have, if you have a really big antenna and a high frequency, it can be a contributor to your minimum noise, just the noise from the moon itself. Thank you. Do the moon have mass cons that change the, the gravity and therefore change the surface? Does that play any role with the reflected? No, not to my knowledge. There's no relationship between gravity and electromagnetic waves. Now, some of us may. I was saying some people, we, some of us may, may get so advanced here, we may end up sending gravitational waves, right? Experiment with gravitational waves. We'll hear the first uh, hand that makes a contact over gravitational waves rather than electromagnetic waves. So I think we have a ways to go before we do that. So if most of us, or a lot of hands, have like two meter 440 um, transceivers. Are there transverters available to let you go to 1296, mm -hmm. that, or is it better to get a rig that's dedicated to that? Well, uh, you know, I think you'll find that there are differences of opinion on that, okay? I'm perfectly happy with my, my 2000, and it, it comes with a uh, 1296 module in it. It's, people say, well, the 2000 is deaf, and it is deaf, but I'm, on, on the moon, I'm serious, I'm going to have a preamp on my antenna. So it doesn't really matter uh, how sensitive the 2000 is you know, out, out of the box. I'm never going to use it that way. Uh, and I find that very convenient. I think there's some newer rigs that come out offer that capability. One of the things that you want to look at is stability. The 2000 tends to be very stable, which I ap appreciate. Some of the other rigs that are around are not as stable. Uh, there are ways of getting around that. Uh, there are lots of transverters you can buy. Uh, you just look on the internet, you'll find that there are many sources of transverters for 1296, all the, all the, uh, the handbands. You can buy a trans 
verter for 47 gigahertz today. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, well, thank you.